Hello, I'm Malcolm Harslett. She was brought up during the Depression, her abilities repressed, as most women were in those years. But she went on to contribute so much to society. Who is she? Well, we're meeting her next on Our Time. Lovely to have your company once again for Our Time. Barbara, Barbara, Barbara. Yes, welcome. Hello, Barbara, Barbara <laughs> Adams. How lovely to have you on the program. Now, I have to come clean. Last program, your son was on. That's Martin right. Hamilton Smith. And you were sitting over there and we took one quick shot. I was. And I said, we could record your segment right now. And you said, no, 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 I've got to go and get my hair done. <laughs> so you have now. You're Typical looking, woman. You're looking fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, Malcolm. Barbara, you've had the most amazing career. Can we talk about when you were born and then people can do their own sums? Well, Malcolm, when I was one month old, my mother took me home. The house had been empty and there was a cobweb on the window and candles were the only thing around in 1931. No mm -hmm. electricity. She leaned over to brush the cobweb. The curtains caught a light. She snatched me out of the cot and ran out. She was only in her pants and singlet. And it was 40 degrees. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good gracious. And that was your introduction to home. That was my introduction to the world, I guess. <laughs> All at home, certainly. So these were depression years, weren't yes, they? Yes, they were. How did that affect your early life? Well, uh, my early life I wouldn't have even known. But poor mum, she lost everything. The house burnt to the ground. There was no water in the tank, no water in the river, the creek. Oh, my goodness. But uh, my life... Oh, we had a happy childhood. We were as happy as the days. How many of, were there of you? There were five of us. Yeah. We didn't know we were deprived. That's interesting mm. you say that because everyone that does have a tough beginning, they basically all say the same thing. We didn't know. We made our own fun. No, we we didn't need mobile phones. <laughs> we, we didn't have the internet. We were quite happy. We were as happy as the day is long. Yes. And the days were long, but... I think we found out more about where we lived and what was around where we lived. Because I was brought up in the Adelaide Hills. Um, my parents weren't particularly flush with money. I'd wander off in the scrub, come home for dinner at night, mm. or tea, yeah. as we called it then. We did that too. Yes. Yeah. Life was much, much simpler, I agree. But from that simple life, you obviously grew up. Education-wise, what happened? Well, when the war came, of course, Dad had gone fishing because we were had to eat and live, but he was sick of it because he used to be away from Monday till Friday. He'd come home on the weekends and the war came and everybody said, we'll be over in six months and you'll get four pounds ten a week. Yes. And uh, Dad and Mum thought that was a pretty good idea. And four Mum wanted... ten is nine dollars now for That's those who right. don't remember. And Mum wanted to get us into the city because we were getting older and her parents were writing letters and saying the children won't get a good education. And where then she were, moved to the city. So where were you? We were 30 miles out of Port Lincoln in a le little oh, town goodness. called Lake Wongaree. Oh, really? Yeah. That much I didn't know about you. Well, it got a lot of attention a few years back when there were big bushfires there. Right. We've got a photo of your parents getting married. It's lovely looking at the clothing they were wearing because <laughs> it is sort of straight out of the 1920s. Um, Obviously, the thing I love in these old photos is the men were always sitting and the women were always standing. Yes, that always intrigues me. Yes. Well, <laughs> so the dress wasn't ruined, I suppose. It was all about dress. But I love this because it's very sort of 1920s with the short, with the shorter the dress. The short dress, yes, yeah. which is quite unusual. Been long dresses now in my living memory. So that was a very different. Well, this is actually your whole family here, isn't it? Um my whole family, yes. Your whole family? Yes. Now, where are you? I'm looking at this photo. To I'm in the, a little bit to the right in the front, and, or not, if you're look, looking at the fact that you're sitting in the photo. Yeah. And on my lap is my daughter, Teresa, and alongside me is my son, Martin, that you mentioned earlier. Oh, right. <laughs> I see. How amazing. Yeah. The, so, <clears throat> life was so different then, wasn't it? Yes. To what it is now. Yes, it was. Um, we did make our own fun. Food wasn't, you know, it was sort of boiled veg and mm. meat if you, or cabbage. a rabbit. Or, or cabbage. Oh, it was goodness. very big. I mentioned cabbage to my niece the other day. She, she didn't know what it was. Cold slaw. <laughs> did you tell it was cold slaw? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though, um, because if you couldn't grow it, 
you didn't get it to eat. That's right. And it's sounding like we were so badly done by, but really we weren't. Everybody had a veggie garden. Yes, Mum that's loved right. a veggie garden. Yes. So you started a family. You started a family young because everyone sort of did. Well, in my day, Malcolm, there was no pool. Mm. The girls got married at 18, the boys at 20. Yeah. Any older than that was considered odd. You left on the shelf. That's right. And uh, the babies arrived regularly every two years. <laughs> <laughs> so how many did you have? I had six. Six children. And the pill came in just towards the end in the 60s. You didn't have any more there. No. <laughs> and I told my 17-year-old daughter once that how lucky she was to be there because she was number five and uh, that... If the pill had been around, yeah, she, she might not have, not been, have there. been there. So she told her best girlfriend that I'd said she was a mistake, <laughs> <laughs> which of course she wasn't. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely meant to be though, isn't it? It's it is. Your family but, is so important to you. But your family have gone on to achieve so much, but it's really been through your influence. Well, in well, a way. Well, because... I didn't want them to get married young like I did. Right. I wanted them to have happy lives and do all sorts of things. First, yes, which they all did. It's sort of the opposite now, though. People are waiting until yeah. they're sort of in their thirties, right. living their life, travelling the world, and all of those things. But in our day, and I put myself in this category, but in our day, it was all about well, you got married young, and then when your kids had grown up and left home, you you went on the big retirement trip and to when New I, Zealand. Yes, like and my parents did. Like my parents too. There would be a retirement trip was two weeks in Loxton. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds so funny now in today's world I talking know. about these things. They thought it was wonderful. Now, but you were sort of in a position, you had kids and you had friends with children and you realised that, who looked after the Well, kids? after the war in the 1950s, the government had big notices up everywhere. Everyone they wanted back in the workforce to rebuild the country. And, of course, I already had four children then. And I thought, well, I can't go out and get a job, but I can look after my friend's children. And that's how it started. I had a girlfriend to help me. We had to pick up and deliver the children because people didn't have cars. Can you believe the 1950s people didn't well, even true. have motor cars? That's very true. But yes. my husband was very good with cars and we had our old second-hand jalopy. <laughs> and I would go and pick up the children mm. and return them at 5.30 at night in this jalopy. They had never seen my house. Right. They had made the appointment with me over the telephone. So we're talking about the very early stages of childcare. Right. Because you stage. were actually instrumental in making that happen in That's Australia. right. It was the very early stages. So then when it grew, we built a big room on the house. And then when that, we outgrew that, we bought the house next door, which happened to come up for sale. And uh, so it happened. The, I had a very large childcare centre, up to 90 children at Panorama. But Amazing. then later on, I bought other centres because people would get into the childcare who thought, oh, yes, I can look after kids. But they didn't realise the hours are so long. Yes. Six in the morning, yes. 6.30 at night. Yep. And the picking up and delivering thrown in. And, and uh, the feeding and the wiping yeah. of the bottoms. and So all they'd that. come to me and say, oh, I shouldn't have bought this centre. And I'd go and have a look and I'd think, oh, I could fix this. And I'd put my best staff in there. And so it grew up and I had five centres in the end. Then, of course, we had to have an association because the government said, oh, you're employing these people for five shillings an hour, (laughs) domestic people to help us. And the government said, we have to have an award. So then we formed an association. And I became the president of that simply because I was the most outspoken. Well, you're telling me the story that you didn't want this thrust upon you. No. You were happy for somebody else to do it. Well, what happened was there were 11 of us at the inaugural meeting and only one brought her husband. And in those days, the men were the king. Everything, men did everything. Women were very well, inept at Well, they uh, weren't business. inept, though. Mm. It's just they weren't allowed to. That's right. The bank You'd... wouldn't let you open an account without That's your right. husband's signature. That's right, I mean, exactly. Things have progressed. We talk today about how difficult it is for women, but in fact, things have progressed enormously in your lifetime. That's right. With well, the lady who brought her husband, of course, we elected him the president. <laughs> but once we all got going, uh, they said, oh, we want a woman to lead us because we used to get invited to go to all kinds of government functions. Child here became a real government potato. Yes, well, see, that's interesting. Because of your influence and what happened to Martin as well, this is just, here's a picture of you at one of the 
things that you're involved with. Yes, yeah, so I was very lucky because first of all, we went to the Employees Federation. We had to have a professional secretary. Mm -hmm. And then we moved on to the, um, Federa the um, Chamber, the, the Chamber of Commerce. Commerce, yeah, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it became oh, right. later. Yeah. In the beginning, it was just the Chamber of Commerce. And they were our official secretariat. And uh, because of that, we got involved in a lot more interstate uh, travelling and things like that for the... And um, seeing this up all over I the I became country. the president of the Commerce section right. of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And as such, I got invited to conferences interstate and that's how I came to be in that photo. With what I love about you, though, you've said to me before, whoever was in power, whether it was a Labor or Liberal government in power, you you certainly used your influence with them to achieve what it was you needed. They were absolutely... You caught them all. They were absolutely wonderful to us, either Labor or Liberal, and they almost gave, always gave the women the childcare portfolio, of course, which made it a lot easier for us with our lobbying. Hmm. But when we got the subsidy for childcare, that was quite a big lobbying thing. We had to go to Canberra for that. We had the president of every state childcare association in along with us. And by this time I was federal president, so I was the leading them. And uh, we actually went into the office of the then male minister yes. for education and he graciously bestowed the subsidy on our clients. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Look, there's so much more to talk about in your yeah. life and we'll be back in just a moment to do just that. Our special guest is Barbara Adams. <music> Our special guest is Barbara Adams. Barbara, you were really instrumental in setting up the childcare, the dealing with the government, but just talking about your son Martin, as we were about to before. Um, it's interesting because it actually showed your influence in Martin as a politician here in South Australia because he crossed the floor from the Liberal Party to the Labor or as an independent um, because of trying to make a difference. And I think that really came from you, didn't it? Well, it did because my father was very political, but he um, always said that the answer to all the world's problems was democratic socialism. But he used to get the communist magazine as well. Mm. It was called the Tribune. Yeah. So he used to look at it, all sides of everything. Yeah. And he'd expound away at the kitchen table with the <laughs> advertiser in his hand every morning. And he was a political tragic, and I'm afraid I'm a political tragic. And I think I turned Martin into a political But it, But it is really, person. it's the future of our nation, of our society, yeah. to have politicians who actually are attentive to what's needed. Yes. And all the carry-on that's going on at the moment with because of uh, elections coming up, it's such a shame that everybody's um, against whatever party is doing whatever Everyone's against each other instead of working towards a common goal. It's become very volatile politics. Have we, have we lost the care of the people, do you think? Well, some of the pundits are saying that big, uh, big organisations like Labor and Liberal will diminish and there will be a lot more of the smaller groups mm. amalgamating together. A bit like they are in Germany, you know. Well, it's starting uh, to happen more They and have more. to always cobble together all the... Some other yes, group. Yes, it takes get... longer to mm. form government, but yeah. maybe that's good for us. So you've written a few books, and I love this particular one because um, you're wearing the same. <laughs> you're wearing no. the same clothes. What a coincidence! When did you write this? <laughs> two thousand and two. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah, I, I like hanging on to my things too. I retired in nineteen ninety eight. It's called survival. Yes, that somebody said to me one day, why did you work such 12 hour, long hours, 12 hours a day, seven days a week? Because we used to babysit on weekends. Oh, and gosh. I said, it's called survival. Yeah, well, it is. well, there you go. <laughs> With there's, six children. And there's two other books that you've written as well, these. Yes. Um, this one. That is about my father. Mm -hmm. He, you know, when he was doing the fishing, he soon worked his way up to be the secretary of the South Australian Fishermen's League, which is now called SAFCOL. Yeah. And he would have think gone into politics if that hadn't been for the war. Yes. I think Isn't that's that where he was heading. Yeah. And this one? That's my uncle who was killed in the First World War. He couldn't get into the army and 
for at least the first two years because he had false teeth and they had huh. rigorous health rules. Isn't that fascinating? But in the end, when so many beautiful human beings were killed and died in that dreadful war, the uh, recruiting sergeant said, if you can eat a bush biscuit in front of me with your false teeth, I'll let you in. So he went and ate the bush biscuit <laughs> and he got amazing? in and uh, two years, 18 months later, he was killed uh, in, um, in Belgium. So your life is very much a snapshot of the last, dare I say, 90 years. Yes, it is. And, you know, all the many of my friends are younger than me. I say they've grown up in the golden era after the Second World War. They've never had to go and fight a war and say so willingly join the army. Mm. War has never come to our shores. We've been very fortunate. Yes, we've been very fortunate. And I tell them they've had a golden life and they agree with me. They think they but have. It's, but it's not only that, from, from eating fish your father caught, you know, sort of out in the bush, not quite knowing where the next food source would come from if you hadn't grown it yourself. That's right. Um, to moving to the city for the education that you have, uh, that, that you have and have achieved over time. And you've given so much back to the community, including in service clubs as well. Yes, well, of course, my, fa my husband was in the Rotary Club at Mitcham when we had our childcare centre there. And he used to always come home so happy. So I used to <laughs> think, if Rotary ever takes women, I'm going to join Rotary. So eventually I did. And then, of course, I've gone on from there with other service clubs. I'm a member of the Commonwealth Club. All the time I was bringing up the children run and running the centres. I thought, when I retire, I'll do all the things, mm. as my parents did. Now yes. they're doing all the things first and then having the children. Yeah, that's right. They're doing that's all the travel and the fun and the... It's amazing. Yeah. Well, well, you were... Was it a, was it a beauty contest, you...? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I was just walking down Rundle Mall and a lady came up to me and said, would you like to go into a contest? We're having a Queen of Industry contest for more mature age women. Well, of course, oh. I went home and told the kids at the dining room table and they got so excited. Oh, Mum, you must do it, Mum. Oh, Mum, you must do it, Mum. So I did. I love and it. We've never... got a shot of that, of you with the sash. Yeah. Um, it's, just, <laughs> it's just interesting because... As you were saying before, there weren't the colour in photographs wasn't the same as it is now. No. And this is just a photo of the photo. Uh, yes. Um, but you've also had a lot of pets over the years, which is oh the pets, been interesting. Yes. Well, well, we all have because we've lived so long, I suppose, and poor pets don't. Here's one with one of your dogs. I kept looking at it, thinking. This is a god dog got two heads, but that's not what it is. It's your hand. It's my hand, yeah. Yes, well, that, that particular time. dog, Martin, was 18 months old and I used to put him in his high chair with his wheat picks. The dog would put her paws on the tray of the high chair and he would have one spoonful for him and one spoonful for Trixie. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the hygienists would go yes, crazy, go crazy. Now, wouldn't <laughs> they? <laughs> isn't that a, a pet becomes a member of the family? I know, really, isn't it? it is. It's lovely to see children with pets. And, of course, my husband loved pets. Yes. The first, the 20 years we had Panorama Day Nursery before the uh, um, health Nazis got control of childcare, yeah. we had pets all the time. But then right. they put, like, if you had a rabbit, we used to change the straw once a week. The health Nazis said, oh, no, you have to change it every day, and so on and so on. So eventually the pets went. But it was wonderful. The kids it's loved bit, it. Yes, it's a bit of a shame in a way because if we don't know and understand how to treat animals, uh, if children don't, then... The children loved it. We, yeah. When we had the pet lamb, one little boy was waking up at half past four in the morning, screaming to his mum and dad, take me to the nursery, take me to the nursery. I said, what do you want to go to the nursery for? It's half past four in the morning. He said, so I can feed the lamb because the first <laughs> child in, we used to have a big lemonade bottle with a teat, yes. we'd get to feed the lamb. Uh, and uh, they just loved it. it was, so many stories. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. So unfortunately your husband did pass away yes. and um, suddenly you met someone who took you to sea. Yes, and I, le I was getting to the stage where I was, the children were all growing up, my children were all growing up and I was able to take things a little bit easier. And so I crewed on his boat for 11 years and then when he sold that boat, I bought my own boat. And mainly because I needed somewhere to sleep when I go down to the Royal South Australian <laughs> Yacht Squadron for functions. But however, <laughs> I've always it. find some 
guy that sold his boat who had skippers for me, so right. it's pretty good I can go across the Gulf and I've been to Kangaroo Island a few times. And but who cruised it for you? Oh, just the gentleman at the moment. I've got a lovely gentleman called Ray Hampson oh, okay. who sold his boat last year. Yes. He's 80 years old and has just had one knee fixed, but he's still out there and he's So you're fantastic. after younger men then? <laughs> Well, he's just a friend. Can I be honest? <laughs> can I be honest? You're about to celebrate your... Oh, uh, you can tell. No, you can tell. I can tell. I'm, a, I'm going to be 90 in December. Incredible. What mm. an incredible life. So I had 40 years running childcare centres, retired in 98. Didn't think I was going to be around oh, this long. Well, that's why, in fact, you wrote this book yes. with your photo on it, isn't it? Yes. So that all those hundreds of children that you looked yes. after could recognise exactly. you from this. Exactly. I love that. That's such a great story. Yeah. Even when they're growing up, they'll recognise me. And uh, it's amazing. It is amazing. But we did become, in the 20 years with Panorama, we were like, we, the children had more waking hours with us with you, than they yes. had with mum and dad. I think that's it was very like common family. though. It, well, mm. it is. And the sad thing is they grow up and you lose them. Yes. That's and you, right. lose, you, you lose this little family yeah. that keeps changing, yeah. admittedly, keeps. but you lose the connection with the families. And the children move on to another life, mm. primary school and high mm. school, and they barely remember you. Which, that's uh, true. And they never get a chance to thank you. But the parents always remember me. I run into them in lots of places. Okay. <laughs> they always remember. But that'll be grandparents now, wouldn't yeah, it? Yes, so most of them are grandparents yeah. now. Oh, amazing. We're going to come back in a tick just to wrap up with Barbara, but such an interesting life, and we'll have a little bit more of that in just a tick. And welcome back to our time. Barbara, your children have all been quite successful. So your eldest girl, Penny, I've known for a very long time. We worked together on Here's Humphrey for many years. She became the executive producer of that. Martin, of course, is in pol has been in politics and is still very, uh, I guess you'd call him an influencer now in many ways. Yes, he is. Tell, tell us about the rest of your kids. Well, um let, uh, Teresa was a model, the one that's here tonight. Mm -hmm. She uh, went into modelling, but when she realised she was never going to be six feet tall, she uh, then ran the models. Yep. And she did very well with that in Sydney for a while, but the big companies pay at the end of the month mm. and the girls would all be there waiting for their pay mm. <clears throat> as soon as they'd done it's the tough. job. It's tough. So yeah. that got a bit tough. Agency. So then tough. she got a job with a full-time permanent job then with Stella International who are tennis racket right. people right. and got to travel overseas. So she finished up living in London for 30 years and Amazing, had isn't it? two children born over there. Yep. And uh, she didn't have the children until she was 39. So okay. there you are, you see, yes. 20 years after well, her mum. Yes. And, and uh, your other daughter we often see on television. Yes, and she's a newsreader in Sydney, in Queensland, um, Brisbane, sorry. Right? Yep. But uh, she didn't have her child until she was 34. And, and then, her name um, is? Her name is Lexi Hamilton smith So we can watch out for... Lexi as well. Yes, on telly. you can. You've had an amazing career and done an amazing amount of work that has really progressed the care of children right throughout the last, well, what is it, 60 years or something? Yeah. yeah, 60 years. Long time, isn't it? Incredible. Yeah. What do you think is the... Uh, well, obviously your, your influence over your kids, they've all been hardworking, they've all achieved a great deal, but what is your secret formula for a long, healthy life? Well, my secret formula for a long, healthy life is I never stopped walking. I never stopped, I never sat down long enough to put on any weight or, <laughs> or, or, or get any bad knees or whatever people get when they get old. I guess I just kept moving. It's There's to be active. Of, very, very active. In healthy fact, diet? I'm, Was it a healthy diet? In fact, I'm cabbage. too active. Uh, yes. I, I drive people silly because I move too fast and I hurry them. But we only have a certain amount of life to live. Mm. And if you sit down, you don't live much, do you? No. I well, agree with you. I think it's important to keep, as, as, if you're healthy, just keep going, going, going. But my husband used to say when he was in town with me, I'd always be six feet in front of him and he'd be <laughs> trailing along. 
<laughs> Somewhere so I guess our places to be. <laughs> movement's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. yeah. But is there a secret apart from that? Is it in diet? Is it... Is it's it attitude. Attitude. It's very important because you have to have a cheerful attitude. You can't give in to all the stumbles along the way. Mm. I used to go to bed at night thinking, oh, what am I going to do about this? I'd wake up in the morning and forgotten all about it and it'd just be on with my life. So yeah, there you go. actually that's so important. So often you go to bed with a problem and either wake up with an answer or when you wake up you just feel, oh, it's really not as bad as I thought. If, if you wallow that to me a lot. Wallow in your mistakes or self-pity, yeah. mm. that's like throwing sand in your petrol tank of your car. That's been one of my theories. And one Ooh, of my nice. others has always been one door shuts, another opens. Not another one slams in your <laughs> face. Not that so same. when something goes wrong, there's always a, an alternative. I agree with you there. I think yeah. it, it is important to be positive in life because the negative part's not worth living for. Uh, if you make a mistake, you can always set it right. Exactly. Look, it's almost time for us to say goodbye, but we could just stay here and talk forever. Barbara, congratulations on a life well lived and lived well. Um, these books are a wonderful reflection of you and your family and good luck in the future with all of that. Come back and see us when you're 95. Thank you, Malcolm. Yes. I should certainly do that. No, thank you. <laughs> and you do the same. Thanks for being with us on our time. It's been a pleasure to have your company. We hope we've opened a few windows and doors for you to be positive about the life that we lead. So until next time on our time, keep yourself nice till then.